chips. Bam, motherfucker. This truck is totally 90s. Come on, playboy.com. So that's the coffee bean where David Bowie was signed. Right there. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> I always heard it was at that Jamba Juice up the street. <laughs> you want to know how Pat Smear joined Nirvana? He was working at the SST Superstore, and Kurt walked in and... Right? Yep. The end. <laughs> the rest is history. No, I remember Kurt saying, I found our second guitar player. We're like, wow, who? Pat Smear from The Germs. We were like, he's still alive? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a long time ago. I was supposed to be dead then? Fuck. Yeah. Whose idea was it to play Man Who Sold the World? Well, I think it was my idea. We were sitting in Kurt's living room going through his record collection. He said, let's pick our cover song for the Unplug thing. And he goes, let's do a Bowie song. You love Bowie. I'm like, OK, cool. And we're going through it. And I see as Man Who Sold the World. I'm like, fuck, it's got to be off this record. Definitely pick one from this record. And we settled on uh, Man Who Sold the World. In 1975, what was going on here? This was not a big rock and roll town. It was pre-punk. Wow, really? After the 60s blew up, everything died down? Yeah. So actually, we saw Bowie driving around in a beat-up old VW Bug. Eventually, we found out, oh, he's here recording. We tracked him down to Cherokee Studios. He was making station to station. Go there every day. Was, we saw him get out of the car and walk in. He dropped a cigarette, a jeton cigarette. I mean, we... That's actually my first fake name. And uh, it's so bad to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so shitty to say. Was there a last name or is that the whole name? No, that was the whole name. Jeton? Yeah. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. And he dropped the cigarette butt and we ran to grab it. And Darby put it in a little tiny, like, vial thing and put on a chain and wore it around his neck. Darby was already writing, he's writing lyrics and and so one day he did a bunch of writings and he stuck it on the windshield of his car. On oh, Bowie's wow. car. Yeah. And he got a fucking letter back. Complimenting his writing and urging him to go on and do this. And that was kind of the idea of like, what are you fucking doing, man? Pre-germs? Yeah. Bowie wrote Darby a letter. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh my God. Dear stalkers. Yeah, really. <laughs> Well, we're going to start with the Doheny house. What's the Doheny house? Bowie's house where he lived in 1975. Supposedly, Bowie lived off milk and peppers and cocaine. Should we do one of these? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta risk our fucking lives for this. <laughs> and it, it doesn't even look like someone where someone will live, does it? Kind of looks like a mausoleum. Yeah. Not a lot of windows. <laughs> Front door looks like a safe. Yeah, that's kind of a weird looking place. We were hanging out every day, just a few blocks up the street at Joe and Jet's house and dreaming of finding David Bowie somewhere. And you had no idea he was here? No. Wow. <laughs> we got to drive by Joe and Jet's house. I'm going to show you how close it was. Hello. Hello, wow. Miss Joan. What's up, Joan? It's me and Pat. We're driving around Los Angeles, going to all of these old Bowie sites. We were just at the house on Doheny. Right by your your old fucking house, dude. Wait, there's Joan's house right there. There's the house. The house is pink now, Joan. Oh my god. Well, now we're off to Rodney's English Disco, which happens to be Rodney's English Disco again. It's been closed down for decades. And now there's an art gallery there, and their current art installation is a recreation of Rodney's. Hi, Rodney. Hey. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> this is this is the original spot. Yes. Now, part of the reason I had all these records were because of you, obviously, because <laughs> we didn't know what this stuff was. Radio wasn't playing it. Mm -hmm. Well, other than your radio show. So it was on Valentine's Day. 
1971, David Boy sang on a waterbed. He'd sat cross-legged in his dress, playing a guitar, doing The Man Who Sold the World album in its entirety. And then he even did songs from Hunky Dory, which he hadn't even recorded wow. yet. And that was his first L.A. performance was in Paul Fijian's living room on his waterbed. Can you take us to all these places? You want to go to these places? Let's go to these places. I think, I think this, is, this is it right here. First concert in Los Angeles on a waterbed in that house. Yep. In the living room. Was the waterbed always in the living room? Yeah. 70s, man. Ronnie, what what ruined the Sunset Strip scene? Charles Manson. No, <laughs> no, no, in the nineties. No. I asked you this once, and you had an answer. Yeah, what was it? Parking. Pa oh, parking killed rock and roll. <laughs> well, what saved rock and roll? I like the what? Manson album. Uber. Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get something to eat? Yeah. Where should we go? Let's go to the Rainbow with a rainbow room. You know what I'm really terrible at? Parking. Backing up is the worst, too. Fuck. Girl, you look good. Won't you back that ass up? You fine motherfucker. Won't you back that ass up? Call me Big Daddy when you back that. Ho, oh, who is you playing with? Back that ass up. I'm glad we're eating, because I I'm haven't. I'm hungry. Famous people. Famous people. <laughs> Famous right here. See it? You been to the rainbow before? I have. Have you tried the garlic bread? No, it's a prop. Don't say that on camera. Did I ever tell you about my Bowie email exchange? No, tell me about that Bowie email exchange. We played at his 50th birthday party at Madison Square Garden. And that was the last time I saw him. So that was in 1990. Seven? About two years ago, I got approached by this movie to do a song for the movie. So I thought, well, maybe I'll have someone else sing. I'll do the music and then have another vocalist. And I thought, well, maybe I'll ask and see if David would want to do it. God, that's reaching high, man. I know. So the next day I get an email and it says, David, I watched the movie and I got to be honest, it's not my thing. He said, I'm not made for these times. So thanks, but I think I'm gonna sit this one out. And I thought, oh man, what a bummer. So I immediately email back and say, no worries. I totally understand. I hope you're well and I'll see you around. And I hit send and within like a minute and a half, I get an email back from him. And it says, all right, well that's settled then. Now fuck off. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> is, he, is he kidding? Yeah, like, I couldn't it. tell. So I emailed back. I said, well, I guess I'll see you in another 16 years. And he immediately sends one back. It says, don't hold your breath. Oh. So I send back one that says, what? No more birthday parties at Madison Square Garden? And he writes back, no more birthdays. I've run out of them. Dark. But then he wrote, but that was a really fun night, wasn't it? And I didn't think about it until recently when he passed away. It kind of made me wonder, looking back at everything, if he felt like maybe he, he was running out of birthdays, you know? And to not hold your breath. He meant it. Kinda. It, it trips me out now that I think about it. But he would also do things like email me in March and say like, well, Happy New Year. <laughs> like three months too late. <laughs> Here's what I remember about trying to learn Man Who Sold the World. Nobody could figure it out except for you. Nobody could find that chord. And you were like, oh no, it's like this. <laughs> Failures. Failures is when you don't get back up. There's a point in time when you think about someone so much that you need